Thank you all very much. That's good stuff. Well, take your copy of God's Word and turn to Revelation chapter 18 this morning as we continue our study through this rich book, Revelation chapter 18 today. Revelation 18. So, as you know, the 2020 Summer Olympics are supposed to begin July 23rd of 2021 in Tokyo, and uh, there's still some debate as to whether that's going to actually take place or not. But every time that you have the Olympics, summer or winter, you will always find Southern Baptists among others, but you'll always find Southern Baptists there sharing the gospel. And there's always a, a huge effort to get Southern Baptist believers, missionaries in country there to share the gospel with usually, now it won't be this way uh, this year, they won't allow fans from around the world. Typically, there are fans from around the world, so the world comes to the Olympics, and we share the gospel with the world so they can take it home. But the other group with whom Southern Baptists are always there sharing the gospel are the athletes. Most of the athletes spend years and years and years preparing for the Olympic Games. And almost all of them have their hopes dashed sometimes in a matter of eight seconds or a minute. So if you could try to picture the utter devastation that these athletes, many, most, find themselves in. And so it's at that point that we want to share that there is hope in Christ. But in picturing that sudden, shocking devastation, this is the scene we find in Revelation 18. Now, you and I know as believers in Christ that the devil is a master at painting a beautiful, slick sales pitch for sin in my life, in your life, in the lives of all. And then as soon as we say yes to sin, He masterfully switches chairs and hats and becomes our accuser. Now, for believers, we know that we don't get to heaven by being good. We're pronounced righteous because of what Christ did, our faith in Him. Nevertheless, we know that feeling. But as we look at this chapter 18 of Revelation, all of that, all of the emptiness of sin throughout history we're seeing the ultimate and final emptiness of sin, the whole system of sin, the lie of the devil over the history of the world culminating in sin's ultimate defeat, but also sin's ultimate emptiness. It's a fascinating chapter, Revelation 18. Read with me. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth of her sensuality." And I heard another voice coming from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. To the degree that she has glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow, and will never see mourning. For this reason, in one day her plagues will come, pestilence and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong." And the kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her will weep and lament over her when they see the smoke of her burning. 
standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and every kind of citron wood and every article of ivory, and every article made from very costly wood, and bronze, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and spice, and incense, and perfume, and frankincense, and wine, and olive oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and cattle, and sheep, and cargoes of horses, and chariots, and slaves, and human lives. The fruit you long for has gone from you. And all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour such great wealth has been laid waste. And in every, every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and as many as make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. And then a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will not be found any longer. And the sounds of harpists and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will not be heard in you any longer, and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you any longer, and the sound of a mill will not be heard in you any longer. And the light of a lamp will not shine in you any longer, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will not be heard in you any longer, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all who had been slain on the earth. Tell me the Bible is boring. The first thing that I would say to you this morning is that the wicked seem to prosper. We see this over in the psalmist, Psalm 37 and others, telling us, don't don't look at the wicked. Don't look at what you seem to see on the outside as pleasurable. And the commercials come on and everyone committing every sort of sin in the movies and everyone committing every sort of wickedness is happy and joyful. And this picture painted for us, on the outside, it seems, it seems that, that, that those who oppose the Lord and oftentimes are profiting and are succeeding, and everything is going so well for them on the outside. And we see this here again. We're in the middle of, again, we're in this several chapter section on the building for the battle of Armageddon. And, and you say, it seems like it's the same thing about three chapters in a row. Well, the Lord must have wanted us to see it three chapters in a row, for that's how he gives it to us. And again, we come back to this Babylon. Who is, what is Babylon? Is it physical Babylon? Babylon founded in Genesis chapter 10 by Nimrod, one of the descendants of Ham. Genesis 11, we see Babylon, really the first capital of the world at that time. Physical Babylon was destroyed, but it's the spirit of Babylon that lives on. The spirit like the people at the Tower of Babel saying, we don't need God. We build a name for ourselves. We trust in us. And so this spirit lives on. Whether this Babylon in the book of Revelation has anything to do with actual Babylon or not, we don't know. As we've talked about before, many point to Rome. Peter talked about Rome as being Babylon, that spirit of Babylon. What will happen in Rome, we don't know. Will it have anything to do with the Roman Catholic Church? As some say, I have no idea whether it will have anything to do with with the church. I don't think it'll be any of the personalities we know right now. But there will be, as we've seen, this fake trinity. There will be a false prophet. There will be a religious entity that will try to get all of the world to worship the Antichrist with the devil behind all of it. But it seems that she's done so well. 
Here comes this, this angel out of heaven, an unusual angel with great authority. And the angel, it says the earth was illuminated by the presence of this angel. It's, it's like Moses when he'd been in the presence of God and he, he's shown. The picture here is that from the throne room of heaven, from the headquarters of heaven, this angel has been suddenly dispatched because suddenly the spirit of Babylon, which is the devil, will be destroyed forever and ever. And he pronounces with a mighty voice, fallen, fallen. It's as good as done is Babylon the great. All of the world forces with the devil's influence against God, starting in Genesis 3 with the serpent trying to get Adam and Eve to turn from God and going all the way through history until today and until this time, fallen forever. She's become a dwelling place of demons and a prince of every unclean spirit and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. Here we see the demons, again, the demons, these fallen angels who were sent out, cast out of heaven with Lucifer when he turned against the Lord. Demons aren't cute. They're not play toys. They're not funny. They're horrible, evil servants of the devil trying to turn all of the world away from the Lord so that we will spend eternity with him in hell. If you are in this room, you've become a believer in Christ, they can no longer own you. They can no longer possess you, but they can do everything they can to try to make you not follow the Lord in your life, to make you a miserable believer. So they're not cute, and here they are. They're there, verse 3, all the nations have drunk of the wine of the passion of her immorality. The kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by her sensuality. Again, not one woman with whom uh, these merchants are all committing immorality, but all of the systems of the world that turn against the Lord and prosper for a moment. It seems from the outside that things are great, but there will be a beautiful reversal. There will be the greatest reversal in the history of the world. You think you've seen movies with plots that are stunning and ingenious. There'll be nothing like this. Haman and Mordecai and this beautiful twist in the story of Esther, amazing, but nothing like this. Joseph sold by his brothers only to become their ruler and to save his people and the nation, still nothing like this. You get there when you look at the cross and the devil thinking that he had won and Jesus allowing the devil to think he had won by getting Jesus to the cross only to find out in his utter Despair and dismay that Jesus had won forever. That's the first part of this story, and that will be the kind of reversal of fortunes. It seems to prosper, made rich by the wealth of her sensuality, which causes us to ask the question, we are wealthy. Every American is, almost every American, I might say, is wealthy compared to the rest of the world, and there's nothing wrong with that. Scripture says he makes rich and adds no regret to it. It's just how we use it and whether we depend on it and how we make it. But where is your wealth? Where is it from? Is it good and honest and pleasing to the Lord? Then praise the Lord. Some of the most generous people I know are some of the wealthiest people I know. And I believe there's a connection there. I believe God knew that he could use them as a conduit to bless his kingdom. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's how we got it. And do we trust in it? And just parenthetically, I'd ask you to consider if you have mutual funds, which I do. Some of you have mutual funds that are tied to your employer. You can't do anything about them. But you might consider looking at your mutual funds and your other investments to see where that money is invested. Southern Baptists have a tremendous, I'm not, there's, I'm not getting paid for this, just telling you. Southern Baptists have a tremendous investment firm called Guidestone. And when you invest, your money's there, you can know that those monies are not in any of what we call sin stocks. You're not profiting from immorality. The Timothy plan is a non-Southern Baptist similar plan. Just parenthetically for you, you might want to consider that. But what does the Scripture say about having enough? Well, it says much. You know, the Bible talks a lot about money. It says to tithe. Everything that comes your way, the first 10% is the tithe. That's what the word means right off the bat the first 10. If you haven't started that, if you're a believer in Christ, you're not giving the biblical tithe and you're having some money frustrations, it's not complicated. I can tell you exactly why you're having, one of the reasons you're having complications. That's just, that's just a given. 
he says to tithe. The Scripture says to work hard. Scripture over and over tells us that we need, if we're physically able, to work. And even if we're not physically able, there's usually something we can do that is productive. The Scripture says to work. Young people, learn how to work. Learn how to get a job and keep a job and do more than your employer asks. One of the greatest things, my father, you're just getting all these freebies today that have nothing to do with the text. My father who ran a construction firm, one of the greatest things he ever taught me is if you're being paid by the hour, don't sit down. Even if there's nothing to do, young people, stand up, walk around, find something. Your employer gets nervous when he's paying you by the hour and you're sitting down. That's free, but it'll help you. The scripture says, get out of sinful lifestyles. I'm tithing to the Lord. I'm working, but I'm using the money that I'm keeping to pay for my sin. Well, you're not going to ask the Lord to bless that. Get out of your sinful lifestyles. Get in control of your wanter. Oh, it's hard for us. We can have anything today. We may not be able to pay for it, but we can have it today. Get control of your wanter. And don't seek get-rich-quick schemes. Now, the Lord may profit you quickly, but don't seek to cheat the system and, and find the one way that you can just get rich quick. Proverbs talks so much about the get rich quick evil eye. And then be patient and wait and be generous. So they seem to prosper. They seem to be the wealthy, but it's, it's coming to an end. The second thing here that I'd say to you that Jesus, the Lord, says to us here is that her demise is certain. It's sure. So come out of her. That's what verse 4 says. Here comes another voice from heaven. God's saying, come out of her, my people. Speaking again to believers who are alive, probably have come to Christ during the great tribulation, nearly impossible, but somehow they've come to Christ. But God says, come out of Babylon. Get out of her ways and the ways of the world so you'll not participate in her sins and receive of her plagues. Now, when uh, someone in the military is calling down the coordinates for the airstrike, you want those coordinates to be right so that you're not struck by the airstrike. This is this picture here. God's saying there's a spiritual airstrike coming on the systems, the kingdom of the world. He says to his people, believers in every age, get out so that you don't suffer along with her and the consequences that are coming to the world. Get out. This is New Testament teaching. Come out. Does that mean we're not friends with the world? Absolutely not. We need to be friends trying to reach those who don't know Christ with the gospel. Some say, well, Jesus ate with the sinners. So therefore, and I say, great, go eat with the lost. But Jesus didn't go to their immoral parties. Jesus didn't go to their immoral places. Jesus didn't do this and this. He ate with them to try to win them to the kingdom of God. Yes, we need to be friends with the lost, trying to reach them, but we need to be those influencing them rather than being influenced by them. He says, get out so you will not participate. For her sins, verse 5, have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back even as she has paid, and give back to her double according to her deeds. In the cup which she has mixed, mix twice as much for her. Again, you see the build up here. This is what God is doing every day. He's defeating the devil every day. He's causing the emptiness of sin to be true every day, but this will be the finality of it, the culmination of all of that for all eternity. He says, there will be retribution to the devil and to those who are walking along with him. That's not his plan. That's not his will. That's why he left the kingdom of heaven, to come to this earth to die in my place, in your place, so that we might come to know Christ and then be set free from the lifestyle of sin along with it. Verse 7, to the degree that she glorified herself and lived sensuously, to the same degree give her torment and mourning. For she says in her heart, this arrogant, I sit as a queen, I'm not a widow, I'll never know mourning. The arrogance of the devil against the Lord. Oh, do not find yourself there. It's this beautiful mixture as New Testament believers, this beautiful mixture whereby we are saved from our sin, from the cross and resurrection of Christ. I didn't do anything to earn it. I don't do anything to keep it. It's a gift of God. And then he didn't just pay the price, but he paid against to defeat the power of sin in my life. And so this simultaneous reverence of God to realize that he doesn't owe me to spare me of the consequences of my sin. 
even though he's forgiven me, and I'm right before him because of what he did and because he's declared me right before him. But still, I want to work to keep that awe of him, to realize that I can't be a believer and say, now I can do anything I want and expect God to keep blessing and protecting everything in my life. I don't know about you. I find God is much more gracious to me than I deserve. If I were God and I were looking at my life, I'd be a lot harder on me than God is on me. Nevertheless, we need to keep a reverence and awe and understanding of who God is and what we deserve. In verse 8, for this reason, and here we see this, this over and over in these next verses, in one day her plagues will come. Suddenly, She's living. The world is there living in her ways, seeming to be prosperous, seeming for everything to be going right. I mean, we look at the newspaper. As believers, it can be discouraging. We see things changing, what feels like to us, so rapidly and with a seemingly no consequence. But the consequences come. But again, I remind you, we don't study Revelation to say, yes, God's going to get them someday. No, we study Revelation to say, this is horrible. What's going to happen to them? A, we don't want to be there and suffer those consequences, but we want to be telling people about Christ so they don't suffer these consequences either. It's not a Christ-like spirit to say, I'm saved, therefore I want God to get those who are not. No, no. No, we gather here not to talk about how they are sinful, though that is part of the subject. We gather here to say they need Jesus, and we've been left here to tell them. They seem to prosper, but God says get out because we see in this last long section the utter, eternal, final emptiness of sin in one hour. The kings of the earth who committed acts of immorality and lived sensuously with her, all of the world living according to the Spirit against the Lord will weep and lament over her because they care for her? No, not at all. But because their livelihood and their sensuality has been taken. No, they don't care for her at all. They're just devastated at what they've lost. Standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, torment, saying, whoa, whoa. I mean, this city, Babylon, which again, may be symbolic of Rome, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn because no one buys her cargoes anymore. The devil promises so much. He promises us that if we'll live immorally, it will give us pleasure. Oh, but the end, as we see in Proverbs, is like being struck in the liver with an arrow. It's empty. It's horrible. The regret, the pain of immorality is ten times more than the promise of immorality. The world says, oh, if we we will gossip and if we'll slander, It will be so rich. It will taste so good down deep. But it is a bitter pill to swallow, and eventually it will turn around against us. The world says that if we will gamble, we'll get rich. We may temporarily. I'll never buy a lottery ticket because I win. There I'll be on the front page of the paper. (laughs) Why is that so bad? Because God provides for me. And for me to take what God has provided and to gamble saying, I still want more and I'm willing to throw away what you've given to me, God, is a slap in his face. There are worse sins in the world probably, but they all combine together and they're all tied together and you find yourself doing one, you get caught up in the other and so on and so forth. The world says and the devil says, drunkenness or drugs, marijuana, all of these things We're going to make you forget your problems. They only compound your problems. And you wake up and you have to do more the next day. The devil says if you'll allow marijuana, which we've now done, it's going to bring so much revenue. I've been in another state. It doesn't bring much revenue. You need more revenue to pay for the police to deal with the issues. But the world promises so much and doesn't deliver. But here we have this picture in these next verses, an interesting section The Talmud said that when the wealth fell from heaven, nine parts of the wealth that fell from heaven went to Rome and one part to the rest of the world. Rome in her day was considered the greatest port ever per capita. If you compare it to the time, unbelievable 
This was a time we're looking at Rome during the great Roman Empire when it wasn't that you could go to Walmart, that you could go to Smith's, and you could buy things from around the world. It's still today, as you go around the world, many cultures, they eat the same thing every day. We're spoiled. We know that as Americans. We can eat from any nation in the world any day we want to. But in that day, it wasn't so, except for Rome. Amazing. We see just, just some of the description here, verse 12 and following, cargoes of gold and silver. There was a Roman general who would travel with 12,000 pounds of silver dishes because they just could. They had so much wealth and so much luxury, and his servants would carry them. Precious stones. These stones, these particular precious stones were dissolved into water, and they were, they were supposed to be for health, but they would just use these precious costly stones and drink from the water that they were dissolved in just because they could. And pearls and fine linen and purple. The shellfish, the murex, from which at this time purple was der derived. Each shellfish had one drop of the purple dye. And so it was unbelievably expensive. But they had it in abundance in Rome and silk and scarlet and citron wood with a beautiful smell, and they would make tables from it because it made a beautiful tabletop, but the trees were so small to, to, to get a tree to make a tabletop was an unbelievably costly item. And yet Nero's prime minister, it was said that he had 300 such tables with marble legs just because he could. They were so wealthy that it overflowed. And every article of ivory and every article made from very costly wood and bronze and iron and marble and then these spices that the slaves of the world would, would, uh, uh, would, would uh, trade and, and the traders would trade, bringing them from all parts of the world, spices that we just take for granted. You have a spice drawer full of all of these, but not so in that day. This was incredible that they could get all of these in cargoes of horses and chariots and slaves. That's where I was headed, and human lives. Some 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. There were houses that had up to 400 slaves just because they could. Of course, this is so antithetical to the Lord. He never, ever wants humans treated this way. Verse 14, the fruit you long for has gone from you. All things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and men will no longer find them there. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Whoa, whoa, the great city. She who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. It was said that Nero never wore the same article of clothing twice. I'm not talking about he washed it and then wore it again. He never wore the same thing twice. He never traveled with less than 1,000 carriages just because he could. So do you understand in this day that we're speaking of some 2,000 years ago to have a port city that had this kind of wealth is unbelievable. Verse 17, in one hour, such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor, and as many as make their living by the sea, stood at a distance, and they were crying out, what city is like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and mourning, woe, woe, the great city, for in one hour, in one hour, suddenly, she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her. Again, not over individuals. We want individuals. God wants individuals to come to know Christ and to be spared from this. Nevertheless, as we looked at several chapters ago, God's wrath is righteous. It is just. He has given. He is giving today every chance. There are those watching this online. There are those perhaps in this room. You say, I believe in God. I, I believe I've been religious. I may have a church membership somewhere, but I have never really come to know Christ as my Savior so that I've been born again, that He lives in my heart as Lord and Savior. He's waiting for you today so that you don't suffer this same fate. He is patient, more than patient. Today is the day for you to surrender to Christ as your Savior or to come back to Him and to come out from this devastation. And then this picturesque, picture in verse 21. It says, a strong angel took up a stone like a great millstone. You ever seen a millstone? I saw one in Oregon at Bob's Red Mill outlet there, almost as tall as me, so about 6'4 or so, <clears throat> <laughs> give or take 8, 10 inches. 
<clears throat> but a, a, a large stone. It, it took a donkey to, to slowly turn the millstone, massive concrete object. And so he says that this strong angel will take the great millstone and throw it in the sea, saying, this is what will happen suddenly to the city of Babylon. We have an illustration for us here. Go ahead. Such will Babylon, he says, be thrown suddenly into the sea. You know, tremendous impact and reaction, but you'll notice very quickly, as the ripples go out and the water falls, the water turns back to its normal state. And just as dramatically as Babylon and the world systems and the devil and all those who are with him are come to a sudden ruin, they're remembered no longer, and it's all over, and it's done. And he goes on and continues to describe what will no longer be found when this comes in one hour. There's a number of messages here for us. Certainly as believers, there's an encouragement for us because we know what Revelation 12 tells us, that the devil accuses us night and day. You're a believer. You've been purchased with the blood of Christ. You know you're going to heaven, not because of who you are, what you've done, but because of what Christ has done. And yet the devil dogs you day and night, reminding you, usually correctly, of your sin and your failures. But he doesn't like to mention that they're all paid for at the cross. So there's an encouragement in the believers that that will end forever and ever and ever. There's a message to those who don't know Christ, and that is, please don't wait one more day, don't wait one more hour, don't wait one more minute. When we pray and sing and stand in a moment, you come, have the wisdom, the fear of the Lord to come and say, if there's a God who loves me that much, I want to know Him. I want forgiveness from the cross. I want to turn my life, not to be a head knowledge believer, but to turn my life to follow Him, though imperfectly. And then there's the message to believers we need to get out of the places where we're in. I don't know. I don't have anything in mind for you. And don't try to force it. But if the Lord says to you today, you know what? Here's an area, maybe a mindset, maybe something you do, you see, you watch. I don't know. An attitude. And the Lord says, you know, in this way, you're really, you're living in the danger zone. You're saved. You're forgiven. But get out because you're living in the miserable place. Come return to the Lord who's paid the price and has forgiven you. As the Lord speaks to you today, we'll pray, we'll stand, we'll sing, respond, say yes to God. Jesus, dear Lord, thank you for the cross to pay for my sin. Lord, I deserve to be in chapter 18. I deserve because of my own ways, my flesh, I deserve to be there. But you in your mercy showed me that I could say yes to Jesus, that my sin would be forgiven, past, present, and future, and that I could spend eternity with you in heaven and be spared this utter devastation. Lord, I pray for those watching, those in the room. Lord, there are those who say, I really don't know Christ as my Savior. Oh, Father, I beg you today that they would not leave this room, that they would not turn off this broadcast until they turn to you and say, I repent. I admit that I've sinned. I know that Jesus paid for it. I want to follow you. Show me how. And then, Lord, all of us have areas where we just want to listen to you and see what you might say to us about our life and things that may need to be changed. And then, Lord, we just relish and thank you that this will all be over one day very soon and that this enemy who dogs us will be gone. Oh, Father, let there be a celebration now as we stand and sing. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Don't wait as we stand and sing. First.